everyone. Welcome to the Funky Marketing Podcast. Today, I have a huge pleasure, pleasure of welcoming uh, Shiv to the podcast. I've been following him on LinkedIn for a while now, and especially a newsletter. I think, Shiv, you are in my newsletter like every day or even every second day. And uh, we're going to talk about today, uh, cover a lot of stuff, uh, possibly focusing on what's your core expertise, like how to... Uh, do post acquisition marketing. Uh, and, you know, I guess you have a lot of things to share as I'm reading and following you. You are CEO of How to SaaS, author uh, of the book, and you're sharing a lot of practical things. And I'm really happy to get into all this. So, welcome to the show. Yeah, excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so, tell me first thing what are you focused on at the moment? Yeah, so I mean, I run a firm called How to SaaS. We are a management consulting firm. We partner primarily with private equity investors that buy and sell software and B2B technology companies. And as they buy those companies, the, we provide them with three solutions. One is marketing due diligence as they're evaluating a target acquisition. Two is we do strategy consulting and we help them figure out what the right marketing roadmap or strategy should be to scale their investments. And then the third is that we provide them with fractional CMO services. Nice. It seems like a, a lot of us coming from different backgrounds are getting into that like fractional CMO things. Like I had an agency, so I scaled it down uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, like, uh, you know, I don't want to work with just anybody to be able to pay the people. And the second thing is, uh, you know, I want to do the strategies. A lot of people don't do the strategies right. A lot of companies, they need help with that. And then if they don't have a team, I have a team to help them out with that as well. Yeah, totally. We find the same thing. Companies large and small, some of our smallest clients are somewhere in the one to five million range. And then our largest clients are 800 million plus and even public companies. And uh, the same principles and, and components of marketing that can help the smaller companies apply to the larger companies just at a bigger scale. And so we see the same patterns as well. And and it's, it's the same story that's just... Uh, repeated as as companies grow and nobody actually steps back and builds the right strategy out for a particular business and so that's that's really where we we add a ton of value uh, for, with with our clients. Yeah, the, the thing that I'm noticing, you know, I like to solve complex problems and I guess you do uh, as well. Uh, but the the outcome always lays in in solving the foundation. Right, because usually companies just overthink things or go through those things uh, fast. But I'm interesting interested. We never had anybody to talk about, you know, what happens after the acquisition, right? And what happens in, in that process. So I'm kind of interested to go into those things and, and cover more uh, of that. So maybe we can start with, you know, when you come up with a strategy that happens after the acquisition. What are some of the, the key things to focus on? Yeah, I think the transaction or just having a company get acquired and just to give some background and level set. Previously, I was the CM of a software company that was acquired by private equity back in 2017. And that's kind of how I really learned about this market and, and where the biggest gaps are. And what I'd say is what you what an investor is doing when they acquire a business is they are uh, uncovering value creation levers that can help them multiply whatever capital that they've deployed into a particular investment. And so you need to have a strong value creation plan to deliver on that investment thesis. And marketing is a big part of that. Now, whether or not you have been acquired or not, or, or whether you will be in the future or you're just earlier in, in the process, a lot of these things still need to be done. Uh, however, companies don't have the right level of marketing maturity usually. And so they haven't done a lot of these, uh, like you said, foundational steps that it's is, if you look at a sophisticated business, they've gone through all of those stages uh, on, on the marketing side. And so uh, what we try to say is post acquisition, you wanna make sure that you're building those components out because the better the job that you do on that side, the more value marketing can help you create in terms of the overall enterprise value of the business. And so there's, there's a few things that, that are involved here. And uh, you mentioned my first book, Post Acquisition Marketing. And I, I cover a lot of this even in my second book called Exit Ready Marketing, which just came out a couple of weeks ago. And um, 
the foundational elements are all the things that you need to have in place before you can launch the programs that help you scale marketing pipeline and, and revenue. So this would be things like getting your TAM and segmentation right, making sure your product marketing is in a good place, making sure your sales enablement resources are in the right place so that when a salesperson has a conversation with a prospect, they can actually close that prospect, making sure your website has all the content required to nurture prospects, making sure you have the, all the right content to nurture the prospect through all the different stages of the buying cycle. And then finally, what is the right go to market strategy for your particular business? Are you going to focus more on SEO and paid search or are you going to focus more on ABM and customer marketing? And depending on the business, the answer should be quite different, whether they should focus on which which channel or not. Um, and then and then you get to the actual value creation avenues. And this is your actual demand generation work, how much you invest into different channels and programs, tracking what, what's effective, what's not effective. Should you reallocate budget from one channel to another channel? And then you get into things like actual content marketing and SEO and thought leadership and everything else that builds presence in the marketplace. And then finally, there's customer marketing and making sure you're expanding existing accounts or retaining existing customers just so that you're building a more sustainable business over time. And then finally, as those things start to do well, you need to have the right data framework, the right budgeting cycles and, and reporting set up so that you can lobby for additional budget and increase your marketing spend that ultimately helps you drive more pipeline and revenue. Yeah, I, I'm listening to you and I'm, you know, because I didn't work with companies who are acquired, right? Uh, I started working with uh, B2B startups and now more mid mid-sized companies and eventually enterprise level companies, most of them who are coming from B2C with build brand and now they are moving to, to more of a B2B and building a different product and need to build on that side of the equation. But it's basically the same framework that you need to install in any company when you come in. The, the, the line of the things that you do is more or less the same, right? Right, right totally. Totally the same whether you're a younger business, whether you're bootstrapped, venture backed, or private equity uh, is your sponsor, the fundamentals are still the same. You still need to make sure who's your ideal customer. You need to make sure that your messaging and positioning for that ideal customer or market is set up the right way so that you can compete with all the other options in the marketplace. You need to make sure that you have the right messaging that's being disseminated across all your different channels and programs and mediums, whether that's your website or a specific social media post or an ad that you're running. And so all of those things are, are the same. It's just that the scale changes and how much money you're deploying behind that changes. Yeah, that's, that's not a small difference. Um, what I, so basically, uh, you know, you can focus on the long-term goals as you start in, but you know, as you, you were saying in in your content and, and in the book you know first 100 days are something that basically makes the creates the foundation for how it's going to go further and in this case especially you know you need to bring in the revenue right right from the start and and set up how are these things happening how our process is going and how are things developing from that standpoint so maybe we can start with what are some of the pitfalls or some of the traps that you see over there that a lot of people overlook and, and you know, they regret it afterwards. Yeah. I, I, the first 100 days is like, um, it's a framing in the private equity world because usually that's looked at as basically the first quarter after an acquisition is the most pivotal time because that's when capital is deployed. That's when the investor is heavily focused on the target acquisition and optimizing it and then at some point it reaches like steady state and the business can continue to to thrive and just run the business as like business as usual um however the first 100 days are is that moment where you can actually make that impact and so during that time you want to do certain things just to set up the organization for success uh number one would be just getting your data in order uh, i can't tell you how many companies we go into where the marketing data is completely all over the place. People don't have full visibility into how much marketing spend is generating in terms of return, which channels are working, what's not working. And so really getting to a place where you have the right metrics and accountability framework for marketing, I'd say is the, is the first step. Number two, you want to make sure that you're, as you come up with that, those insights from the data, 
you're actually turning it into actionable steps and, and items that you can execute on. Um, usually when we do data analysis for companies, we'll find at least 30 to 50 percent of their spend that is being wasted on channels, programs and campaigns that just aren't generating any ROI or any revenue or mm -hmm. pipeline. And so that becomes a very quick fix to turn off. And then the next question becomes, well, where should we reallocate this budget to and what are all the other areas that we can invest into? And that could be an existing area that's doing quite well for the business, or it could be a completely net new area that the company has never invested into in the past. So identifying all of those items and basically building a roadmap for uh, programs and channels and campaigns and content that the team can execute on. And then finally, the last two things are uh, the team and budget. And on the team side, it's making sure you have the right people in the right seats and you have enough of the skill sets required to execute on the defined roadmap. And in every company, there's always a gap. Maybe they don't have a data ops person. Maybe they don't have the, a, a content strategist. Maybe they don't have a good CMO or they're lacking a good CMO. So identifying that and taking steps to fill that seat is critical to actually create value because you can have the best laid plans, but if you don't have the right team to execute on it, it's not gonna work. And then on the budget side, you wanna make sure you have enough budget to invest in those programs. In a lot of cases, we find that companies are just have budgets that are too small. And for the in compare, when compared to the growth aspirations of the business, it's one thing if let's say it's a $5 million business that wants to get to 5.5 million next year, it's a whole other thing if it's a $5 million business that wants to get to 10 million next year. Uh, and it's a very important concept just for investors and CEOs to understand that leads and MQLs and pipeline is, is not free. You have to pay for it in some way, whether it's in the form of programs or people. And so you have to forecast that budget out. And we find that companies in their maturity are just, just not mature enough to build a bottom-up forecast that says, okay, currently our marketing budget is $700,000. If we want to increase our pipeline and revenue by $2 million next year, here's how much more we need to invest into marketing in the next 12 months in order to give us a chance in order to be able to get there. And falling short on the budget side is the quickest way to miss your targets. Because if you don't have the right budget, you're not going to have enough to invest in the channels and programs, and you're not going to generate the pipeline you need to generate in order to be able to get there. Yeah, so, sounds logical. So uh, maybe we can we can go a little bit deeper into uh, you know what can companies do if don't have they don't have the exact budget that they need? Do they change the goals or adjust strategies differently? Or if they have the budget, you know. Uh, what do you start off with uh, in that case? In, in terms of if there's not enough budget? Yeah, if there is not enough budget or we have this amount of budget, let's see where do we invest it first. For sure. And in general, every company has limitations on how much they're able to invest because there's always competing priorities. You may want to invest more into sales or product or, or anywhere else. So the... This is where it's the marketers or the marketing leaders role to bring data to the table to make a good business case for why more budget is required. And just to connect the dots, right? Let's say we want to close 1 million in new bookings. Well, what does 1 million in new bookings look like in terms of number of deals based on our average deal size? If it's a $1,000, uh, if, excuse me, if it's a $10,000 deal size, then we need about 100 deals that we need to close. Okay, we need to close 100 deals. How much pipeline or how much, how many opportunities are required to close 100 deals? If our close rate is 25%, we now need 400 SQLs in order to close that pipeline. If 400 SQLs are required, how many MQLs do we need? Maybe it's 25% it's of MQLs become SQLs. So in that case, we need... Uh, 1600 MQLs in order to be able to generate that pipeline, then how much does it cost us per MQL in order to get there? And you, if you just attach a basic number, let's say it's 1600 MQLs and it's a thousand dollars an MQL, you're already at $1.6 million uh, in spend. And so understanding just the math there to be able to bring that back to the table to say, now in order to get 1 million in new revenue, we need 1.6 million in spend. And that that just basic math, if you just did that and showed that to your board, it's like 
light bulbs go off and people really start to understand how much money is required uh, in order to get to where they want to get to. And then the next step there becomes you need to be more detailed. Well, how would you allocate that? How much of that goes into programs versus content versus paid media campaigns versus people? And and for each segment, have ROI calculations based on historic performance, based on uh, a forecast that you might do, uh, based on competitive research or whatever else is out there, just to quantify what the impact would be. And then finally, you want to you want to track your performance over time versus projected. And you may not get all the budget that you want right away. Let's say your current marketing budget is 1.3 million. So instead of getting you to 1.6, they might give you another 100,000 or 150,000. Well, start to show what was our projected versus actuals. Are we on track for where we want to get to? And slowly that helps you build political capital over time. And then you can unlock more budget because there's per performance behind that to be able to justify additional spend. Yeah, I love that. That's basically step by step how do you do it. And and uh, I like that, you know, usually companies don't use the math, right? That's why you work with, with them and a lot of other consultants that can give them the math exactly. These are exactly the steps and the numbers that you need to achieve in, in each point you know, to measure specific things to get to the goal that you want to achieve, which is the bigger goal that you want to get to get at the end. And, and then basically, right, it becomes obvious, okay, this is the amount of budget that we need to be able to achieve those goals that we set. Yes, exactly. And, and being able to quantify that for every single activity. The more you do that, the, the, the more political capital you get. And you asked about mistakes earlier, and I'd say that the mistakes that I see people make is not live in this data-driven world as they are instead living in more of a subjective interpretation of what will work or not work, or they spend too much time on buzzwords like brand, or maybe they'll overhaul their website. And before you know it, like two quarters has passed and you're way behind targets. And so really keeping your eye on that, on the ball there and knowing what it is that you need to achieve and then building the right amount of political capital so that like maybe you do need to overhaul your website, but you need to do that at the right time when you have enough political capital in order to be able to actually see a project like that through. Exactly. I mean, that way you're creating the trust with the leadership and, you know, you're exactly uh, giving them, you know, the reason to do something. It's not just because you think that's how you should do it or a lot of CMOs do it like that would be my legacy, you know, those kind of things. It's not, there needs to be a data behind it and the real business reasons for that. Correct. Yes. And, uh, and a lot of these battles are tilting at windmills if it doesn't actually drive revenue and pipeline forward. Yes. Yeah, so, so tell me, um, working with companies, when you, when you uh, get into the company, what are you know, the team structures usually that you are seeing? I know that you are working with different types of companies, so maybe the, the answer will differ. But uh, what I'm seeing, and it happens also in different types of company, there are usually people who are good at their job, but they maybe don't see the bigger picture on how their work impacts the business results. Or on the other hand, there are people who are maybe, you know, with a PR background, those kind of things, or they are maybe good at hiring, you know, that lead the marketing teams. And both of these things uh, actually, you know, impacts how the company will perform. Yeah, for sure. I think the team is such a huge aspect of it. And um, I think a good way to think about it, instead of like saying what types of structures we see is I'd say, what is an atomic unit for an effective marketing organization? And I'd say mm -hmm. there's, you have a marketing leader, a CMO, a VP of marketing, obviously, but then there's four or five key lieutenants that that person needs. You need a head of demand gen, you need a head of content, you need a head of marketing ops or revenue ops. And then you need a head of corporate marketing and then you need a head of product marketing. With those five roles, you can scale to any sized organization and then you can set like you can add layers of like region or language or product line. And so we've seen marketing organizations that are 500 people large and they're split into the same domains, but just segmented by region territory or, or language or, or product line. So within those five roles, it's the head of demand gen's role is to handle all the different campaigns and programs you, that you're running to to move move 
pipeline forward. The content team's job is to create SEO content, website content, like nurture content, emails, campaigns, all of that stuff. Then you have the corporate marketing team that's running events and PR and comms as required. You have the product marketing team that builds all the core assets, the core messaging, sales enablement stuff, wherever required, working with the product team, working with the sales team. And then finally, you have a, a, a marketing ops or a revenue ops team whose job it is to set up the entire infrastructure and framework to measure marketing performance and, and contribution to pipeline and revenue. And it's really only four or five basic reports that are required. But with that, you can actually track the performance of all the different domains. So when we come into a business, if any of those five or six domains that I just mentioned are really missing, that's when we start to dig deeper and figure out where the gaps are. Do we need to hire somebody? Or if, if one of those areas is underperforming, identifying that this is a gap in the organization and it needs more support in the form of additional talent. Yeah, that's that's a good overview. Uh, I'm asking you this because, you know, I'm just moving from mid-sized companies to the enterprise level companies. And, you know, those insights actually help me get the, the bigger picture and see. And I guess it's useful for a lot of people who are also, also listening. Um, so maybe what I didn't ask you is, uh, you know, what are some of the industries or uh, the exact companies that you are working with? And maybe we can go and talk more specifically then. I mean, we work mostly with B2B companies, some B2C, but it's either B2B technology companies or tech-enabled services or software companies. Um, and and what we've found is even other industries where I've done advisory or consulting work, the, the principles are the same. Every, mm-hmm. every company at a baseline needs to figure out who's their ideal customer, what's their what's the market or industry that they're going after what are the key pain points and what are the differentiators that separate out a particular business in that marketplace and then figure out what channels and campaigns and content are required to penetrate that market and the better you are at that it's more of a art than a science but as you understand that then you can really apply it to to any industry so for us you know we're pretty agnostic and and we work, work pretty much across the board. Yeah, I, I love that. So it gets me to one question that I've been talking with a lot of people last week for some reason. I don't know, it came up as, a, as an important topic. What are some of the things that you saw that actually change maybe in the last year or the, the last, you know, like six months? Did you see any, any changes that happen? You know, like a lot of people... Uh, usually say it's the moment when uh, we spend a lot more time on social than we spend doing our actual actual job we spend more time in communities which we don't have before before covid i'd say small specialized communities uh and that basically changed how we look at the seo how seo works in that way like uh it's not only, you know, that you build the awareness on Google as well, you build the awareness and those kind of things before people have the intent. Then right. you move on mid side, middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel on Google. And, you know, that's some of the things that, uh, you know, that I've been talking about with people. Anything that, that's on top of your mind? Yeah, I mean, I'd say I hear a lot of buzzwords uh, out there about AI and... and mm, yeah social and dark social and all these kinds of things. Um, I'm pretty, uh, I would say I'm, I'm more reserved in my thinking with this kind of stuff. Uh, I'm a big believer in making sure you get the fundamentals right. And, and in general, most of the companies, let's say, you know, we've worked with hundreds of companies at this point. I've been either the CMO or advisor for hundreds of these companies and private equity investors. And I'd say, maybe one or two out of a hundred companies really have nailed the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. And so all the time spent obsessing about optimizing for the next big thing is all, is, is all good. But um, I find that the return is significantly higher if you get the fundamentals right. And that takes time. And uh, like, just, if you think as an example, a company like Stripe or a company like Shopify, 
they've completely nailed the fundamentals when it comes to product marketing or demand gen or SEO or even ABM and a lot of these other areas um, that smaller companies or mid-market companies try to optimize for. And so now they can run larger plays and and invest a lot more into marketing or, or hold a huge thought leadership event and, and things like that. And so I, I find that it's almost better to stay away from whatever's the hot button topic or the sexy thing uh, in, 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 in the realm of marketing versus uh, just trying to get those fundamentals right. And the fundamentals will always be the same no matter when or which market you're operating in, whether it was 20 years ago or it'll be 20 years from now or today. It's, it's making sure you cl clearly understand your customer and understand what their pain points are and how your product or service solves that problem and doing the best job that you can to effectively communicate the benefits of that to that market and then creating supplemental or secondary content that educates them to help them succeed in their respective roles as they interact with you or even without you so that eventually as they find a need for your service they'll they'll find you and hopefully eventually work with you as well. So just that as a simplified marketing strategy, I think can apply to most businesses and most companies just haven't done that piece right. So before they jump forward to some of those other areas, I'd say nailing down these fundamentals and that process can take two to three years. And yeah, I don't want to make it seem like longer than it, than it should be, but it's really nailing that there's a ton of value that can be created because at every step, as you'd get that piece, right, you're, you're going to start to see more pipeline and more, lead flow and, and more customers coming through. Yeah, that's that's very well said. I'm, I'm always telling to the to the companies like create a feedback loop where you actually talk to the customers regularly, get insights because that will help you nail the right strategy, nail the right content and come up with, you know, with how in what kind of strategies are you investing in, right? Is it APM? Is it partnerships? Is it something else? Because customers will tell you that. Sure, there are some companies, especially now with tech companies, that you know you cannot ask customers everything, but knowing your customers doesn't mean that you just serve them service, right? It means knowing them better than they know themselves, so you can actually give them what they need to solve the problem in the right way. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally agreed. Yeah, what, uh, what, maybe I can ask you something because I think a lot of listeners, especially from, from this South, Southeast Europe will, will appreciate any experience with companies who are moving from being a service based companies. What I have in mind, especially tech companies who was, were outsourcing development and now are slowly moving into the product based companies, building products and moving in because the, the background is, there weren't any historic knowledge or people who can share it so they couldn't move and now that's happening. So maybe, you know, you had experience in any companies making the transition. Well, I would just say whether you're a service trying to build a product or a product layering on a service, I think the, the first step is really understanding the, the business that you're in. Um, I find that businesses often get this wrong and they try to be something that they are not. Um, so, it, and there's a great book on this that I often share. It's called Profit from the Core. Um, and it talks about this idea of first step is to define your core business and understand what your sources of differentiation are and what actually gives you market power in the marketplace mm -hmm. and then expand into adjacencies. And oftentimes you should, you should expand to adjacencies that are that are near adjacent versus like two steps removed, let's say. And so something that is an immediate adjacent is going to create far more enterprise value versus if you go too far from your core business, now you've added a huge layer of distraction. And so really understanding what is your core business and then if a software or product can connect to your service, then it might make sense. Like we ourselves have toyed with the idea of starting a software on top of our service many times over and we've often shelved it we're currently working on something that's just one step removed and so it's the first time we're actually giving it a big investment from our side um but even then like i always question like is this the right move because what is the core business 
uh, that we're in and where do we actually create the most value in the marketplace. So that would be my advice is for, especially in a market like this where capital is scarce and uh, interest rates are super high is just being sure that the thing that you're investing in is actually going to uh, supplement or am amplify your core business and help you create a, a bigger core business over time, not just a distraction. Yeah, I love that. You, you make sure that your core business is as it should be and bringing in the returns that you uh, that you need to actually kind of start thinking about, you know, making a move to changing something or moving into the second layer or second business or how it goes. Yes, exactly. From, from that side. Exactly. Perfect. Love, love the advice. So uh, tell me, I would like to know a little bit more uh, about not other companies, but about you, your company and how did you come up with what you are doing now, you know, like building a consultancy business, uh, also being an author and building, you know, that additional thing uh, that you are going into next. Yeah, just, you know, I shared earlier previously that when I exited that software company as a CMO, saw that this huge need in the marketplace of so started this firm. And um, since then, we've just been slowly building this. Initially, it was just me. This was five years ago. Now we're a team of about 13 people and, and still growing. And um, the books, uh, you know, I look at it almost as product marketing and and thought leadership in the marketplace. They're super specific. I even have a podcast called the PE Valley Creation Podcast, and the book titles are super specific, like post acquisition marketing and exit ready marketing. It's not for people that are just looking for generic marketing advice. I write for private equity investors and CEOs because those are our customers. So yeah, you, I, you know exactly who you're talking to. Exactly. And, and that means saying that means writing in a way that maybe other people who would be in adjacent marketplaces or uh, have other opportunities for us may not read that content because post acquisition marketing is often something that a CEO or an investor would read, but maybe not a marketer, uh, even though I think we probably should because there's a ton of great knowledge in there, but that's not who I'm writing for. And so I would look at it as that. And, and that's really where we try to we try to eat our own dog food, if you will, is getting getting all the stuff that we're preaching to our clients. We get it right ourselves and making sure we get our marketing right, our, our sales motion right. Like uh, we're hyper focused on our private equity partners and adding as much value to them as possible. We invest a ton into account based marketing and relationship building and account management because we have, uh, I would say, 50 to 60 key private equity partners that drive our business forward and we're always looking to expand how many PE firms that we're into. So we've mapped the market and we do account based marketing to those types of accounts. So it's a it's a lot of the same work that isn't visible on places like LinkedIn because LinkedIn is people look at LinkedIn as an acquisition channel. I look at it as more of a distribution channel for thought leadership that maybe some people that follow you or are connected with can be nurtured on. And but our primary go to market is through our partners and and that's where we invest a lot of our resources so um and then finally in, on the software side like you asked like we're, we're hoping to build something that can add value to those exact same buyers and in, in private equity investors so and that can hopefully amplify our, our core business as well and so that's where we're investing in that now yeah basically you know that's like as you're working in a bank, you see, you get to know the system, you see what's, what's the piece missing, then you get out of it, create the company around it and, and solve the problem, right? It's kind of, kind of the same. And, and I like what you said about LinkedIn and I, and I agree. Uh, and I see more and more companies going into the partnerships. And also I'd like to tackle that a little bit. I see more and more companies that consider partnering with with marketers, with creators, with salespeople, depending what uh, you know, who are their target personas or the customers, in a way that you know, let's building something together, like co-creation of the content or partnerships in that way, uh, and kind of using that as a leverage to create the awareness, maybe on the brand side, and you know, basically just get that familiar feel the feeling inside their audience. Yeah, for sure, something that they actually need help with and you can add value for sure. Yeah. Um, and hmm, kind of want to get your point on that. So, so there's a lot of buzz on LinkedIn, like being a place to create relationships with your audience. Right. Uh, but you need to go beyond that 
to create a relationship, right? It's not just, you know, let's just talk with people. You need to engage them with something and kind of communicate with that. And I want to merge that to, uh, to, you know, how you are actually launching your books. You know, how you look at that, like the product launch and what uh, do you include inside it? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of I, I see LinkedIn, like I mentioned, as more of a one channel that you invest into. Um, I see a lot of companies or p- individuals or consultants and freelancers leverage it as like their only acquisition channel. And so they're very reliant on posting daily as a way to generate pipeline and revenue. And for us, it's sh- that's not the way we generate business or, or the main way, at least. Um, it's a way to distribute thought leadership and I've gained followers over time because of that. But for the most part, I just try to share things that are helpful with the audience and not like salesy posts. There's, and there's a ton of that on LinkedIn, which I, I'd say I heavily dislike because it kind of ruins the platform. Um, I think even just there, if you have a reliance, we're talking about acquisitions and everything. If you have an over-reliance on one channel, odds are that you don't have as good of a business as a more diversified uh, uh, channel, let's say more diversified channels of acquisition that you'd have in place as a company. And so for us, it's, it's the books, it's the thought leadership, it's LinkedIn. At the same time, it's speaking at events, it's our private equity partners, it's it's existing clients and referrals. It's it's a bunch of that stuff, and 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 so with that, then we don't look at it as like constantly needing to post daily, um, and then you just look at it as as part of your part of your marketing mix. I think more people should be leveraging channels like that. And what you'll find is, no matter what platform you're on, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, YouTube, whatever it is, um, there's a subset of the market that is more active on those platforms than others. And there are other segments of the market that are completely unreachable uh, on those platforms. So private equity investors, as an example, uh, on our side, we are not going to meet um, thousands of private equity investors through LinkedIn necessarily. They do follow my content and they'll engage with it from time to time. But what really helps us is the partnerships and direct relationships with those folks. Um, and that has gone much farther for us. And so that's where we invest our limited marketing dollars. If I had to make a trade-off, where would I rather invest? Do I post 20 times on LinkedIn or do I build the direct relationship with the investor? I'd rather build a direct relationship. Right. And I think that's something that companies miss because they don't understand that not every market is as active as let's say marketers and salespeople are on LinkedIn. And so they'll over-invest there and not see the kinds of results uh, that they want to see. So it's really, again, understanding your customer and knowing where, where are they and what's the best way to find them and build those relationships? Exactly. And I, I find that, you know, extremely hard to get those information when I start working with companies, right? I like to ask them, you know, invite the customers on a call and let's ask them, you know, who you are following, which newsletters are you reading, on which events are you going? You know, those kind of things, because then basically you uncover a lot of stuff. So, you know, like maybe you guess that it's LinkedIn. Right. But maybe their industry is not on LinkedIn. Maybe they, they go and get educated, you know, I don't know, on Reddit, hang out on Reddit in a certain community or something like that. And, and it's actually what unlocks the strategy and everything that you're going to do from that point. Sure, you can, you can guess and come up with the strategy, but if you don't double check in talking with the customers and getting to know them, actually, then you are basically, you know, just guessing, not sure. doing the actual marketing that you should do. Yeah, for sure. And so it's really, I think, really understanding your customer and uh, some of those questions like newsletters and what events you go to and things like that are super important. And then it's also really understanding their reality and and what actually what they actually care about mm-hmm. in, in terms of their respective situations and businesses and what are the key pain points or triggers to discuss or address before they'll entertain a conversation with you? It's not just as simple as them following your content, right? Your content needs to also speak to those pain points. You can get, for example, you can get thousands of followers posting a lot of generic videos on LinkedIn, and that would be a very bad idea if you have something very specific to sell. Um, you, You should go the other way and have lesser 
viewers and likes and commenters and and people that follow you but if you have the right audience it's much better so yeah you reminded me now of a question that i often ask the existing customers is if you have to buy this now this service or a product how would you uh you know where will you go to look or what would your steps be right i put them in in the shoes uh of the company and they start thinking like you know like we are thinking at the moment right doing right. doing the research and you get tons of different ideas and most of them uh, up to the point that you said about linkedin say sure we will have a list of like three or four choices that, that we uh, want to choose from then we'll go to google find out you know who is the ceo who are the people reviews those kind of things and then we'll go to linkedin to double check if what we found out is actually true right mm-hmm. do they actually know what they are talking about do they have the the exact background does you know all the those information that they'll find find actually checks and, and you know and that's just you know one of the reasons to do it and i guess what comes out from linkedin the way i'm looking at it is you know it's one of the key pieces in building the trust right and exactly what you said you don't need to post like tons of content but if you post the exact content that resonates with the audience and with what you're selling then you are actually doing good you're actually adding value yeah i think the more you focus on adding value to your core customers the better you will do even if that means you're saying no to others oh i uh, i'm kind of uh, the guy who's saying you should say a lot more no to the others yeah. right because then you open up the door for for the right customers for sure for sure um anything on top of my, your mind that i didn't ask you and that came while we were talking about we were going back and forth with different topics i yeah. have one more but you know no, I think I think this was great. I mean, I'm I'm glad we got to do this, and and thank you for having me on. And I'd just say, if uh, folks are listening, uh, check out my new book. It's called Exit Ready Marketing. It came out a couple of weeks ago, and we'll add a link in the in the show notes, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate that. So, uh, one last question: you you wrote two books on different kind of topics. What's the main difference between you know uh, being at one stage and then being in another? Yeah, the post acquisition marketing I wrote pri- primarily for the PE investor and CEOs who've been acquired, um, and then uh, the new book Exit Ready Marketing is actually for founders who haven't exited their business yet and want to exit. And oftentimes that's a very challenging journey because you have to build a business to a certain point that it is viewed as an attractive asset for an investor to deploy capital into. And so it's showing them what are the core components they need to have in place to make an exit more likely. Yeah, so, sounds good. The topic that always gets to my mind is, you know, I see a lot more young founders focusing on exit, right? Not building a sustainable business. So that comes, you know, often as, as a topic, you know, whether this is good or no, or I, and I guess it depends on... on yeah, I, I would say the, the way I think about it is that if a business is worthy of being acquired. It is a business that's worthy of continuing to operate and own. Um, so I would, I'm not, I guess, advocating for building those kinds of businesses that you just only build for the sake of exiting, even though there's no real profitability or uh, enterprise value. It's more just what are the fundamentals you need to have in, in place that make you a better business? For example, revenue predictability is an, is an example of something that you need in a business Otherwise, an investor likely will not buy your company. So how do you build revenue predictability into your company? How do you make sure that month over month you don't have lumpy revenue in one month and no revenue in another month? How do you make sure you have the right executive team? Like there's all these components that go into making an asset more attractive for investment. And so really it's for founders to think about those kinds of things. Yeah, and I will say now to to everybody listening, now she shared the answer to that questions earlier when when you broke down how do we actually get to the pipeline and the goals and the results so now go back to the beginning of the episode make sure to to stop uh when you get to the point that you need uh, additional explaining or or you need to to dig more deeper reach out to shiv on on linkedin uh to you know if you have any questions or or you want to get deeper into that or uh you know find the books 
in the description notes and maybe check them out. Uh, Shiv, any other address that you want people to go except LinkedIn? No, that's it. Uh, this was great. And Manya, thanks for, thanks for having me on. Uh, thank you for, for doing this. And, uh, you know, one more time, I need to say it publicly. Sorry for me being, being late. <laughs> it rarely happens, but it happens. No problem at all. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Guys, uh, keep it funky.